Well, today we're going to uh, finish our study in Hebrews. It, it seems like it's so fast because when you do one in a day, one in a night, uh, it does kind of make it a little faster, but it's been 40, this is the 43rd and final message of Hebrews. And, um, you know, if you listen to one every Sunday or listen to one every week, you're, you're going to get quite a bit of lesson in it. It's been a lot of fun. Um, again, Lord willing, next week uh, we're going to do Romans in the morning and Galatians in the evening. That's going to be very interesting because they really complement each other. Uh, a gentleman asked me, could I do Matthew after uh, Romans? I don't do special requests. If I do, I would be the people that are here. Uh, what they would deem something that would help them and their spiritual growth. That's one of the perks of being here. You you get to, to ask the preacher. Actually, I asked them, and it was interesting because the books that they both wanted were Romans and Galatians, which is what I had in mind to preach. Wonderful Lord. All right, let's get to it. Jesus Christ, verse 8. The same yesterday, today, and forever. Um simply stated within that passage refers really to the eternality of Christ at a minimum it refers to that this other stuff that people keep saying that it means is again just a colossal bunch of ignorance um, you know that he's a healer and he's this because he's the same yesterday today and forever and all this kind of foolishness yeah I, I really get weary of how just we we have this protected sense of ignorance that we just do stuff and we don't really think about the consequence of our ignorance of how we insist that the Bible says it means this when the context of the passage which we fa fail to to see or are not willing to see uh, that it means something quite different and again as I've said time and time again that if this were just an issue of an opinion and yeah, that would be one thing you're entitled I guess, you're not really entitled to anything. You can give an opinion, but I don't know about this entitlement business. Um, you, you can give an opinion, but this is not an opinion. This is what God said. And if you're saying something wrong pertaining to what God says, that's pretty serious stuff. I'd be very cautious about attributing to God something that he allegedly in your mind said that he in the word did not say. Again, this speaks of the eternality of the Son, and we looked at Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 12, the things we've already connected uh, in the entire study. I want to look at two passages again, which in the Old Testament, excuse me, one in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament, that refers to the eternality of Christ. In Micah 5, 2, um, it is stated, But thou Bethlehem Ephrathah, Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is, to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Obviously, that refers to Christ. Christ is eternal. Um, the, Christ didn't begin in Bethlehem. Christ is eternal. He's the eternal Son of God. God the Son. Matthew 2, verses 1 through 6. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east of Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judah, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, thou art not the least among my, among the prince of Judah, princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Which is a Micah 5, 2, just a different, a different translation, but it's the same thing, and, and they understood that. Even though the verse here, and we want to go back to Hebrews uh, 13, 
verses 7 and 8, even though the verse and the verses that we've read, the supporting passages, teach us concerning the absolute truth of the eternality of Christ, the context again determines the meaning of the passage. I believe the primary emphasis of this verse is not just in only eternality of the Son, but in light of verse 7, uh, remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you, the word of God whose faith follow, considering the, the end of their con conversation, their lifestyle, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. The spiritual leaders who taught these saints about the Messiah have died, but the one in whom they taught is eternal. And again, that would be the main thought of verse 8, the eternality of the one they preached. The believer needs to rest his or her focus on the fact that no matter what is changing, be it personal persons or circumstances, Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God and will always be the same. He will never change. Remember, also in this chapter, verses 6 and 7, because this leads to uh, us to believe that these verses also add credibility to the interpretation. Let's go to verse 9. Be not carried away with diverse and strange doctrines. You talk about a passage that I could take months talking about, which I won't do. This is the one. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. So again, this is when you talk about meats and things of that, you're referring to a Jewish ritual mosaic system. Obviously, that's the context there. And... Um, you can only imagine at this particular time with with the Jewish religious system rejecting their Messiah, rejecting the teachings pertaining to the Messiah, that strange and diverse types of doctrines begin to rise up um, continually uh, to counteract the, the growth of Christianity. And he's saying to these people, stop allowing yourself to be carried here and therein with doubt and hesitation. Stop allowing yourselves to be led astray uh, now to this opinion and to that opinion. And that is the nature of error. That is the nature of false doctrine. It never leads anyone to anything that is firm and stable, but always opening up many doors to useless questions and doubt. That's one of the reasons why I just have a hard time with the the public forum, the uh, the Facebooks and things like that, because there are, a, again, a, a harbinger of error, even from professing believers asking numerous ignorant and stupid questions which they shouldn't be asking, uh, and making statements challenging people to prove something from the Scriptures. Why would you even do that? Why don't you just study? You know, why do you do stuff like It's foolishness. You're causing people to be carried about with strange and diverse doctrines. You know, if the heart is established by grace, no law is going to be that which is going to satisfy you. And in the case of our age and ages in the future, God willing, no false teaching and no amount of questions, silly and ridiculous questions in the public form is going to help anybody either be established by grace. You don't want to be responsible for promoting error and promoting confusion. And as I said, false doctrine never leads you to anything that is firm and stable, but always opening up many doors to useless questions and doubt. And it is. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 through 6. This is one of the reasons why Paul left Timothy in Ephesus. Uh, as I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, and thou mightest charge some that they teach some of the doctrine, not to give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which as in faith so do. Now the end of the commandment, and it's not the Ten Commandments, it's the, it's the, the charge, the commandment that God gave, or rather that uh, Paul gave to Timothy. The end of that commandment is love out of a pure heart, a good conscience, and an unhypocritical faith, or stable faith. Now that's that's what 
proper teaching will produce if people take heed to it. That's the, the end goal. Okay? The, the charge was to command some that they teach no other doctrine. No other doctrine than what? That's a question. No other doctrine than what? The truth that Paul had already taught them while he was there. So Paul already told them and taught them the truth. He invested years of his life in Ephesus teaching them the truth. So the only thing that would be fitting would be to grow according to the truth that they that they got. And this is the truth. And they don't need to be led away by listening to everything coming down the pike. And then he says, not only to Timothy, you need to command some that they would teach no other doctrine other than the one that he already taught them, but that he wouldn't uh, pay attention to myths and genealogies. The Jews were big into family trees and into stories related to the family trees. They, they were big on legends. That has nothing to do with your faith. It's not your lineage that matters, your human lineage and who you know and who they knew and all that. None of that matters. It ministers questions rather than godly edifying. It doesn't even have any ability to edify who you know and who you think you know and your credibility and your none of that matters to faith. The end of the commandment is love out of a pure heart, a good conscience, and a faith unfeigned from which some having swerved have turned aside unto useless jang or wrangling or jangling. Just constant fighting and arguing and bickering. Is a result of false doctrine. False doctrines lead to confusion. Truth leads to stability. It'd be great if everything professing to be a church, if every leader was consistently teaching the truth as the scriptures reveal, as the scriptures are the truth, and every member so-called was a true believer and would follow the truth and would not be led astray with various and sundry doctrines. Or trying to figure out how important they are because they're related to some so-called grand poobob in their lineage. Which matters nothing. Then you'd have a church full of stable people. Truth leads to stability. False doctrine leads to confusion. Some of these Jews were entertaining, going back to the bondage of an abolished religious system. And many hybrids of that system were being offered up uh, to lure them away from Christianity. The saint today needs to be ever vigilant not to allow themselves to be carried away or carried off to follow some novel teaching or some liturgical system of candles and beads and things like these. And, and you know, when you come from that system of candles and beads, you often find so-called believers that produce systems of candles and beads to lure you to what they consider to be Christianity. Well, if you use candles and beads to lure people to your so-called work, then it's the candles and beads church. It is not Christ's church. Christ doesn't need or use candles and beads to lure people in. If it's the candles and beads and the music and the, the big band church, then it's the candles and beads and music and big band church that, you know, that's what you should call it because that's the, the spirit by which you lead people or mislead people to think that they're followers of Christ. The Lord doesn't use that stuff. He doesn't need it. The power of God is in the gospel alone. If that's not what you're believing and preaching as a saving mechanism that God uses to bring souls to himself, well, you may need to you know, go back to it yourself. Because maybe you don't know anything about it. All these liturgical services. And it's easy to lure someone from a liturgical service who was lost and bring them to another liturgical service other than Christ, and they're still lost. What we need, we already have, and what we have establishes our lives firm and sure, and what we have that brings this kind of stability is the grace of God. That's enough. That's all that you need. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, Therefore, being justified by candles and beads and music, and no, it doesn't say that? Well, <laughs> It doesn't say, therefore, being justified by, come by letter, candy for baptism, Christian experience. No. 
therefore being justified by church membership. No, no? Come on now. How about this one? Therefore being justified by lineage of who you know, who you think, who your mom and daddy know. Thumbs down. Hmm. Okay. Therefore being justified by faith. That's it. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that enough? Isn't that enough? <laughs> Isn't that everything? By whom? Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. We also have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. No candles, no bees, no liturgical service, no movies, no smoke bombs and smoke lights, smoke lights or strobe lights and smoke machines and whatever. Beads and candles and all that. No, we have access to God by faith. We don't have access uh, by emotion. We have access by faith into this grace. No? People think if they get on their knees and, and they feel a certain way, they have access into this grace. I don't see that in the text. Why don't we allow the text to determine what God actually is saying? Now, how I feel about the text or don't like what I feel about the text, I get to change it. We keep introducing layers and layers of, of liturgy and error into the work of salvation. And what does that make it? A not another gospel gospel, as we'll see in our Galatians study. By Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, we have access by faith into this grace. Okay. What is the grace? Justification by faith and peace with God. That's it. It's all a matter of the grace of God. It's not a work. We and st we stand in that grace. We stand in this grace and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We have everything we need in Christ. And, and you have nothing without Christ. The life, the emotions, the will, and thoughts need to be reminded continually that we are already established by the grace of God, that no other religious experience or new doctrine is going to give us what we already have. They are not necessary. They are not necessary. They are damning to the faith because they get in the way of the faith and they are hindrance to those believers who are already saved, as we'll see in the Galatian epistle. They are hindrance to the place where Paul, after verse 6, I mean, the first five, five verses in Galatians 1, he goes, I, I'm amazed you so soon removed the hand that called you unto the grace of God. Uh, and he just starts launching on them. He, he said he was shocked that they were so quick to be moved for him that called them to another to another gospel, which is not another. That's why I named it the not another gospel gospel. There are plenty of them out there. And we'll see that, Lord willing, in our study of Galatians. You, you don't need anything. You don't need a bead or a candle. Any, if, if you need a bead or a candle, you might need Christ. Because once you have Christ, you don't you know you don't need a bead or candle. You, you know you have everything. You know you don't need anything else. And you're not looking for anything else when you have everything. When you have everything, you have what? Everything. Everything. And need of what? Nothing. Nothing. Or anything. Whatever grammar with grammatically correct, you don't have need of anything. Or you have need of nothing. You got everything, you got everything. So if you got everything, why are you looking for something? Silly humans. God's grace has supplied us with everything that we need to live the Christian life. God has left nothing out of the package. That's why people, they're so dissatisfied with God's provision. Because they think he left something out. That's why you need plain, old, simple truth. And be done with the foolishness and waste of time of everything other than the truth. Colossians 2, verses 6 through 10. Considering all that we've already read and what I'm going to read now, tell me, what do you think you need? As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Okay, what's left? Rooted and built up in the beads and the liturgy and the... No? Rooted and built up in the smoke and mirrors and religion and come by letter, candy for baptism, Christian experience and church... No? 
no liturgy, rooted and built up in him. Rooted, what we talked about a moment ago, about being firm in his grace in which we stand, okay, rooted and built up in him. Rooted, grounded, rooted and built up. That, that's like a plant is rooted. And then it grows from that point. It just keeps growing. Roots go one way, the plant goes another way. It goes upward, roots go downward. We're rooted and grounded. We are stable in him. We are built up in him. You're not built up any other way. And established in the faith. As ye have been taught. Abounding therein with thanksgiving. So, in other words, you have everything. Everything is in Christ. You have everything in him. You need nothing else. You need no one else. Because there is no one else and there is nothing else. Everything is rooted and built up and centered in Christ. Everything is established in him, abounding in him, being thankful to him, for him. So with all that, what do you need? Well, the only thing you need is to beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men and after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. Beware lest anyone ruin you. Spoil means that through philosophies and vain deceit. The last thing you need is traditions of men, rudiments of the world. The last thing you need is all that and not Christ. For in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him. You are complete in him. Everything is about in Christ, which is the head of all principality and power. You, you don't need anything. You are complete. And complete means... Complete. What do you think you need other than complete? There, there, there seems to be this mass of people that profess to be Christians. Um, they're not satisfied with complete. They want something else to vindicate the... Comp I don't know what they really want. I, you know, I'm trying to put this stuff together. I'm just getting a headache. That's why my hair is getting gray and standing up looking like a crazy man. It's I'm, I'm trying to figure out what is it that they want? What is it that they think they need if they are complete? Do they really believe it? Do they really know it? Are there in places that teach them that? Are they really looking for the, the, the truth that ends the questions? So are they looking for these things? Are you looking? Are you looking for these things? I mean, do you realize what you have or do you not realize what you have? So are you rooted and built up in Christ or are rooted and built up in your religion? Because really that's the only other alternative. Is it your religion or is Christ? The writer again is comparing the elements of the new covenant to the old and said that the meats which is representative of the Levitical system was of no advantage to those who are currently doing them because it did not address the inward need of salvation. It only was outward and ceremonial as well as the fact that as far as God was concerned was abolished anyway. Why would they continue to practice a religion that was abolished by the same God that gave it? It served its purpose and when it was served and its purpose was complete, God removed it. There are no hybrids of Judaism and Christianity. Hybrids of Judaism and Christianity, as we have seen over and over again through our entire study of the entire Bible, are always seen as false doctrine. Any hybrid of it, any hybrid of Mosaic system and Christianity is nothing but false doctrine. And this would be soundly rebuked for the error that it is. It leads to bondage. Verse 10, we have an altar whereof they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. What a statement. The reference here is to the greatness of the new covenant over the old as it was seen in those who served in the tabernacle, namely the, namely the Levites. And the, the main thought here is fellowship. The eating of, 
uh, of those uh, who serve, the, the eating by those who serve, rather, is a reference to the what's called the communal sacrifice. We were in the Old Testament, we talked about the various sacrifices, and one of them is a communal sacrifice. And the communal sacrifice uh, was a sacrifice that the offerer was allowed to eat a portion of the sacrifice with his family after it was offered up to, to God, signifying fellowship with God. But since the Old Covenant sacrificial system was abolished, then those who were still practicing the Levitical system of communal offerings were doing it in vain since the New Covenant is superior to the Old. You don't need to have a communal sacrifice to fellowship with God because now the Spirit of God lives in you. The New Covenant provides all the fellowship you need direct with the Father through Christ. You don't need a communal sacrifice. You don't need the, the mirror, the shadows, the types. You have the reality. It's amazing how I and others get attacked for saying the very thing that these people claim to want. Well, we're telling you, you have everything in Christ and you get mad because you got nothing. You're looking for the next shadow, the next type, the next whatever. And there are plenty of people that are willing to give you the gimmick. It's not going to help you. Jesus Christ has a true and only sacrifice to the believer. Nothing else matters. It is a sacrifice of Christ that brings the worshiper into true fellowship with God, and that on a permanent basis. So no more sacrifices were needed because they were useless. It's over. And all you people out there trying to act like you're Jews, I'm a, I'm a Christian, but I'm, I'm acting like a Jew. <laughs> Would you stop it? You're not a Jew and it wouldn't matter. Being a Jew doesn't mean you're a believer. Being a believer in Christ, you have everything in Christ. Well, I need to have some kind of, of a mosaic system. I need to learn to appreciate the Old Testament. No, you do not learn to appreciate the Old Testament sacrifices. What are you talking about? They weren't given to you anyway. It's insanity how believers get caught up in the foolishness that can't even help the Jews. How in the world are they going to help you? Verse 11, for the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. So the blood of the sin offering during the Day of Atonement was offered up in the most holy place while the body of that animal was burned outside of the camp of Israel, a place that was deemed to be unholy. In fact, according to Leviticus 16, the offer had to ceremonially cleanse himself after he had burned and buried the remains of the sin offering outside the camp. He was, he was considered touched by sin. He was considered to be part of that sin because he, he touched the offering that was used as a sin offering. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. So the blood of Christ is seen in its atoning and sanctifying work, meaning that it was the blood of Jesus that truly brings the worshiper of God into a relationship with God. And it was the sacrifice of Christ that truly made one consecrated to God, not the blood of the Day of Atonement. Um, Christ's blood sanctifies and consecrates once for all. It's a permanent sacrifice, as we've seen throughout the entire epistle. Uh, the Old Testament Levitical work was over. When Christ became the final sacrifice, the work of the Levitical system was done. As the body of that Old Testament sin offering during the Day of Atonement was buried outside the camp of Israel, so Christ died outside the gate of Jerusalem. Let us, verse 13, go forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. Remember, outside the camp or outside the gate, was regarded as that which was unholy under the Mosaic law. The Jew would consider the death of Jesus as that which was unholy since he died as a criminal. In fact, it was the religious rulers uh, that brought reproach on Christ even as he hung on the cross. If a worshiper would truly embrace the new covenant, then he would have to leave once and for all the ritual of the old covenant and thus bear under the reproach of those who still followed his useless tenets. For the true worshiper of God in Jesus Christ to go to Christ outside the camp meant that he would be separated from Judaism forever. It's just not a matter of choosing 
um, one denomination over another. It's saying, I renounce my whole life, and I'm following Christ, the ones you approach. Our, our whole mentality of this misunderstanding of what Judaism versus Christianity meant is nothing to be in no wise compared to, okay, today I'm a Methodist, tomorrow I'm a Baptist. Okay, so what? That's really has very little relevance to anything. The, the issue is who's telling the truth and who's not. But when you're talking about Judaism, and you talk about that versus leaving that for Christ, we've already dealt with this. We're talking leaving your whole life. I mean, Paul was, he was a Jew's Jew, according to uh, the epistle to the Philippians. And he, he renounced the whole thing, his whole life and his religious life as a dung heap that he may win Christ. And be found in him, not having his own righteousness, which is according to the law. But the righteousness, which is by faith in Christ Jesus. To be justified by faith. I mean, Paul, when he renounced, he renounced the whole life, all that religion was a renunciation. All of it was considered a dung heap. And so these worshipers or potential worshipers had to acknowledge that um, I'm leaving and I'm going outside the camp. I'm going to bear the same reproach of Christ. You consider him unholy. I'm bearing his reproach. You reproach him, you reproach me. Wow. They had to make a clear departure from Judaism to embrace Christ. They had to leave Jewish rites and identify themselves with Christ, who the Jews hated. In doing so, they accepted the reproach that came with identifying oneself with him. The writer, and we saw that in chapter 11, verse 24 through 26. The writer urged his readers to go to Christ and to suffer reproach as those who demonstrated true faithfulness in the Messiah, and as he did. These believers needed to continue their focus on what was ahead, and that was the heavenly city. They needed to suffer his reproach. Verse 15, By him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. When one is truly saved, under the new covenant, and looking for the city to come, obviously is going to have an impact on how we approach God down here in our relationship to God. In this relationship that the true worshiper of God has with the Father and the Son brings the worshiper into a unique priesthood. Not the priesthood of a Levitical nature, but the priesthood of believers. All Christians are priests. Uh, not priests in the sense of the Catholic or other denominations. That's not anywhere near what we're talking about. A priest's main function in Scripture was to offer up sacrifices unto God. That was his main function, to offer sacrifice to God. Now, as believer priest. We don't want to be confused in what we are to offer up to God. We're not to offer up to God the same Levitical sacrifice that <laughs> the priesthood was doing. No, not at all. We don't want to continue to offer up Levitical stuff. No, we got a whole different system of sacrifices to the Lord. Okay, and these are well pleasing to God. So we are priests. You say, well, I'm not going to call you Saint fill in the blank. I mean, that's that's not relevant. Having a title of a priest doesn't make you a priest. We're declared to be priests because we are in the household of God. And as a, as a, a priest in the household of God, we are to offer sacrifice continually. 1 Peter 2.5. Let's take a look at some of these realities that we are to offer sacrifice to God. Ye also, as living stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So all believers are priests, a holy priesthood, which is an expression Peter used, I believe, twice in his epistles. We are a holy priesthood. To offer up 
spiritual sacrifices which are acceptable to God through Christ. Okay? We are commanded to offer up spiritual sacrifices. It's never just money, but it doesn't exclude it. There are other offerings that the believer needs to offer up to God. But in this case, we must be reminded again, we're not talking about animals and grain, but spiritual sacrifices. What are spiritual sacrifices? Well, Romans 12 says our physical bodies. You mean, yeah, what do you mean, you mean? Did you misunderstand that? How could you misunderstand it? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, or because of the mercies of God, which is salvation, that you present your body a living sacrifice. Hmm. That's interesting. A living sacrifice as opposed to a dead one. No, you're, you'd offer your body to the Lord as a living sacrifice. Because of the mercies of God, the only proper response is to yield your entire body to God. When you offer up a sacrifice, and we're going to see this in Romans, the sacrifice was to be, or is, at the disposal of the one you're offering it up to. So there was a sacrifice offered to God under the Old Covenant. And whatever instruction God gave to the, the offerer, to the worshiper, to the priest, or to the high priest, they were to follow the instructions. The sacrifice was up to the discretion of God. He said what he wanted to have done to the sacrifice, and they were to do that. Here, under the New Covenant... We are told to present our bodies. We are. It makes perfect sense to do that. You can't have a salvation without a sacrifice. You can't have a sacrifice without something. First and foremost, he says, offer up yourself. A living sacrifice. Well, what kind of a sacrifice? Holy? See, we're, we're in a royal holy priesthood. Well, we offer up a holy sacrifice. Meaning us. Right? Right. Acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable service, reasonable form of worship. The, the very least you should do, and me and everybody else should do, is offer up our body. It doesn't belong to you anyway. Did the sacrifice belong to the person offering up the sacrifice? And You, you, you didn't see him take it back. Once that thing was cut and skewered and burnt and the blood poured in the altar, uh, there was can I have it back. There's no, there's no have it back to get back. It was offered up once. You offer up a sacrifice. There was no I want it back. That was my favorite dove. Well, too bad. We are, as a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices which are well pleasing to God. The first one being you. Why that would surprise anybody is surprising. I want to have Christ, but I want I want control of my body. Well, you need to be born again. Huh? Huh? Yeah, I didn't stutter. You heard me. If the mercies of God do not drive you to surrender your all, then you know nothing of it. Holy sacrifice, acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world. Oh my God. You talk about taking folk out. That, that would take most folk out right there. Take them clean out. Because a holy acceptable unto God's uh, sacrifice can't be conformed to that which is unholy. Be not conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. There's that same terminology, acceptable unto God in verse 1, acceptable and perfect will of God, verse 2. I'm not going to spend a great deal of time here because I want to make sure I finish this chapter today and next time we're in Romans, trust me, we're going to really put the skids on a lot of stuff here and really get to, to learn these things more and more and more. But the whole idea of being worldly conform is, is, is the antithesis of a living sacrifice. Your body doesn't belong to you anymore. Conforming to the world, um, in other words, the world tells you what to do and you do it. No, forget the world. 
I've kind of learned whatever the world says do, I just do the opposite. It's, it's built into my nature, like, go get this. No. You need this. I don't. This is a popular fad. Mm -hmm. Still ugly. Mm -hmm. You need to eat like this. Eat like I want. You need to have this. No, I don't. You, you use it. Why don't you do it? Everybody's a model that's smiling and happy and everyone's drunk. No, you do. That's, that's a lie. Whatever world says, I just, it's in my nature. You go, no. The media says, well, today, I don't believe it. I'm just skeptic of it all. Temperature tomorrow is going to be, no, you've been lying all the other weeks. So what, <laughs> you've been off 10, 15 degrees. Why am I, why are you getting paid $5 million to keep being wrong? <laughs> what else? Well, one of the spiritual sacrifices is, of course, the sacrifice of ourselves, a willing giving of oneself to the Lord. Perfect sense. Number two, financial aid to those believers in need. Oh, 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 there you go. What do you mean, there you go? Stop embracing the stupid, will you, and learn, learn your Bible. That giving is a sacrifice. It's an offering and a sacrifice. Well-pleasing to God is acceptable to God. Philippians 4.15, now you Philippians know also, in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even at Thessalonica, you sent once and again unto my necessity. Not because I desire a gift, but because I desire fruit that may abound to your account. You mean giving is seen as a fruit? Yep, sure is. But I have all and abound, I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice, except the well-pleasing God. That's how, that's how we saw the sacrifice, the giving. He said what they shared with him from Epaphroditus, the gift that was sent with Epaphroditus to Paul, was an odor of a sweet smell, which is when God has the sweet smell, he, he smells the aroma of what is offered. It's a sweet smell. It's an indication of that which is well-pleasing to him. When God wanted certain perfumes made or of incense made, um, he didn't want anyone to make duplicates for themselves. He said, no, this is for me. When I smell it, I, am, I accept it as well-pleasing to me. That, that always fascinates me. And he says, this, is, this offering to my needs is a sacrifice. It is a sacrifice that is acceptable, a well-pleasing God. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Why do people grab verse 19 and every verse 18 or 15 or 17 or 16? I can do all things with Christ strength in me. What about all the passages before that? Hmm? My God shall supply all you need. Stop, stop, stop. Don't embrace the stupid. What does the context of that mean? I was looking at a passage that I was reading forever and a day and just saying like so many others say and didn't even have a clue was the connection to that. It was while listening to Isaiah when you had the uh, the Bible CD on through Isaiah. Oh, I don't think I forgot this past. Oh, man. <sighs> Hope it comes to mind because it was clear. Yeah, my ways not your ways, my thoughts not your thoughts. So forever, you know, we all interpret that passage so much to talk about the fact that, you know, God's ways are our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. And that separates, you know, the uniqueness of God's uh, infinite wisdom from ours and his ways from our ways. And though that be true, that's not the context of the passage. Do you know the context that passage talks about God's mercy? I'm sitting there, I'm sitting on the recliner and you have the, t the, the, the CD going and I'm listening and I'm like, Wow. That's the context of the passage. When God says, my ways, not your ways, my thoughts, not your thoughts, he's talking about his mercy towards those who repent and turn to him. I went like, wow. That blew my little mind. Wow. Yes, it's wonderful to talk about how far and how high and how magnificent the wisdom of God is than ours, but that's not the context of the passage. I went, wow. It blew my mind. 
we do this stuff all the time. We get a passion. We just run with it without any thought what it meant in the context. Ah, oh, Lord, I'm sorry. I, I want, wow. We need to read everything in context. It might be surprising what we've missed. <laughs> you know, when you think about the ways of God, how high they are, how, you know, when, when God looks at showing mercy to people that don't deserve it, and we don't, we can't even comprehend the thought of God and the ways of God in terms of how he administers his mercy to people. Wow. What are the sacrifice? Well, a walk of love. Really? Yeah. Walk of love to each other, to the church. Well, churches are fighting and dividing and splitting and, you know, chilling and grilling and killing each other and can't get along with your neighbor and all that, which is completely demonic. Did I say it? You heard what I said. Uh, the issue is um, uh, the sacrifice that really is a sweet smell to the Lord is walking in love. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2, be therefore followers of God as dear children. Or well, how would you do that? Walk in love. What's the example? Christ also loved us. Wow. How's that demonstrated? Had given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. Wow. Wow. I mean, when we were in Ephesians, we spent a great deal, you know, we spent a great deal of time dealing with a lot of things. When we study the Bible, we go through the Bible, we go through the Bible verse by verse and we learn. And so when we were in Ephesians, we learned so much truth about this. Walking in love, Christ is the standard. He gave himself for us, an offering for us to God, a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. His his offering was was that which was well pleasing to God. It satisfied, satisfied the demands of God. Just like when you walk in love, just like when you give, just like when you live, give your body and give money, it, it all has the same effect. It's, it's a sweet smell to God. It's a sacrifice acceptable to God. It's well pleasing to God. Wow. Yeah. The word acceptable in Romans 12.1 is the word well pleasing, well received by God. I would have to believe that the absence of these spiritual sacrifices displeases the Lord. Sure do. And that's why we have a lot of conflict. Because people are in it for themselves. They're influenced by the world all the time. They don't know how to shut the world out, which clearly shut off things so you don't have to look or be absorbed by worldlyism. It's not like there's some great mystery. Just shut off the source. We know where these sources come from. I don't know what the world we think of. It's such an, a mystery to me. How do, why do I think the way I think? Why do I act the way I act? Because you're pouring that junk in your head all the time. And it doesn't stop in the head. It goes in the heart. It influences everything you do. Everything, everything that's being thrown at us is to cause us to be influenced by these things. Get this. Buy this. You need this. Get it now. Make the call now. Go on now. It's yelling and screaming and music blaring. You got to talk real fast. Go get it. He's spot right now. Get it. Call now. RV. Say God is the RV. Get it. RV. Get it. It's spot. But it's about the RV. You can go swimming. And you can do laps all the time. And then you go in the hot tub. Ah. I just get the mute button. Shut up. I always yelling at my TV. Just shut up. You want to sell a camera? Nah, 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 nah. Oh, what do I need that for a candy bar for? And Wiener Stencil ain't never been that good that you have to have people doing rap songs and it will do 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 do. Don't like that stuff anyway. Do a lot of muting. Like, I don't need to hear none of this stuff. It's just junk. Cars, you know, screaming out. You can't go that fast. Oh, no, unless you're in Germany. You're the only car on a highway, a man, and you drive like 100 miles an hour on the California coast. You could be over that coast in about five minutes in stupid commercials. Incredible. The priests in the Old Testament not only were separated unto God, not only were they holy in their behavior, but they offer up sacrifices to God. God wants his believer holy priesthood in the new covenant who are separated to him to live holy, to offer up 
sacrifice that please him. Yeah. Everything in the new covenant is superior to that in the old. Everything. Even the sacrificial system. Far more superior. I mean, the greater, the greatest example of the sacrificial system is Christ himself to the believer. The walk in love and the, the giving of one's body to the Lord as a, a living sacrifice are tremendous offerings to God. How in the world you can have conflict and fighting and, you know, nepotism and stupidity in the church is just a bunch of nonsense, demonic nonsense. Re just religion and, and just traditional nonsense. As I said last time, it, uh, uh, well, sometime I said, it should be no surprise, most people in church are lost anyway. And I believe that. The issue is this, are we truly priests of God? Or is that some title that we want to wear? I mean, is it something that's real of us or just something we imagine? What kind of sacrifice have we offered up to our glorious God today? What kind of priest are you, friends? It means we go back to Hebrews 13, we want to examine the other two sacrifices that we believe are priests are to offer up. And uh, that is lastly continued continual and unceasing praise with our mouths confessing and declaring his majestic name yeah yeah by him therefore verse 15 let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually and just in case you wonder what that is that is the fruit of our lips yeah move that mouth give you thanks to his name this isn't a show. People are more animated when they watch television than when they watch the preacher. It's amazing how they mute themselves when the preacher's preaching, but when something is on TV, they run their mouths all, all, all the, through the whole program. That'd be time to be quiet, but when you're in the house of God, you need to give God praise. Now, we all quiet. Can't, can't give God praise. Really? But, Reverend, that's part of our praise service. What the world is that? Show me that in the Bible. You got God confined to your program? Reverend, you're just being, you know, being distasteful of our service. I'll show you the taste. We'll keep talking. By him or through him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise of God continually. You didn't say anything about God is subject to your paper program. The fruit of our lips, give you thanks to his name. It didn't say anything about just your church service either. But to do good and to communicate, forget not. That doesn't mean talk. To do good and communicate is exactly the same thing that Paul commanded Timothy to command the rich to do um, with their goods in 1 Timothy chapter 6. To do good and to communicate. To give up the money and to share. Get rid of it. To do good and communicate, forget not. For which such sacrifices God is well pleased. Yeah. To share your goods with other people that have need is a sacrifice to God as well-pleasing to God. Hoarding is not well-pleasing to God. The obligation of believer priests does not stop at praise to God alone, which leads to the last of the spiritual sacrifices, but another spiritual sacrifice are works of mercy, doing good, and Christian fellowship. The word communicate in verse 16 is a Greek word that is translated fellowship, Association, community, joint participation to share which one has in anything. You know, fellowship is more than just sitting in the same building grunting at your neighbor. No, it's to share. We don't have any idea what fellowship is, and I'll tell you why. Because most professing churches have taken the word fellowship and have changed the, the complete meaning of it. Because they think that fellowship has, listen to me, nothing to do with salvation. It has everything to do with it. And as I said time and time again, most of these things are salvific in nature because they are the result of salvation. And if these things aren't being done, you have every right to say, is anyone here in this building saved? Some of these saints were poor because of the persecution of the Jews against them for their loyalty to Christ. The communication was not seen as, or seen as any words, or seen in any words, but sharing whatever they had to the needy saints. That's how you share. That's how you fellowship. 
That is the essence of fellowship here. Fellowship is a spiritual sacrifice, so we're sharing what one has, and these sacrifices are acceptable to God. You want to please God's church body? Offer up to God the sacrifice of fellowship for certainly what we do to minister and help one another please is the Father that made us his children through Christ. So if you have brothers and sisters in need, well, help them. That's a sacrifice well pleasing to God. I mean, if it grieves you to, to help somebody, I tell you, you're sinning. <laughs> you're wrong. There's just no, well, see, preacher, you don't understand that I ain't, I ain't got, shut up. Shut up, stop lying. I'm trying to help you to stop making a liar at your fool's self. You will give to yourself what you want and you will produce a need for what you want. Even if you don't have the ability to get it, you're going to make it a need. You know you do it because that's how you've always done things. And need I remind you, and I will remind you, that the churches of Macedonia gave beyond their ability. They didn't even have, they were in need and they gave to Paul's ability or Paul's need beyond their own ability to give. In other words, they hurt themselves when they gave and they wanted to do more. And Paul said, stop. A gift to the hurts. Don't say that. Don't ever tell people to do that. That's nonsense. You don't tell people to give, give till it hurts. Who are you to tell people to do that? Love compels people to give to those even beyond their own ability. I don't need some stupid preacher to, you know, rah, rah, put guilt in me. You don't guilt people to give. That's unbiblical. Pray for us, verse 18. We trust we have a good conscience and all things willing to live honestly, but I beseech you the rather to do this, that I may be restored to you the sooner. Leaders need the continual prayers of the saints because of the nature of the work, as well as the fact that we are open to the most unrelenting criticism, even though we have a clear conscience and in all areas willing to live right before you. Warts and all, fairs and all, I believe that I can say that it is the intent and the example of myself and others in many churches to live in such a way as to have a clear conscience that is void of offense, to live in such a way that is morally and spiritually right before you. Um, I believe that. That's, what, that's the intent. And the only way that's possible is we understand the nature of what we do, dedicated to it, dedicated to the saints that we teach. And this is what the writer wanted from his readers because he, the need was urgent. Something had to be done. Something that is unexplained prevented him from being with them. Nevertheless, he exhorted them to pray for him. Just imagine how much farther Elisha could grow and minister if instead of ungodly criticisms leveled against us, if the church could cover it together in prayer to God on our behalf. Just imagine how fruitful our ministries could be to you if you as a church would bring us before God in prayer as you pray for open doors and things that would glorify God. Maybe one of the reasons why a lot of churches so-called aren't doing anything is because the people in them don't pray for the leadership and, and don't contribute themselves as living sacrifices to make sure that they are in a position themselves that the, the Lord can bless it. It's not always the pastor standing in need of prayer. It's the whole church standing in need of prayer. Uh, this this whole epistle and everything we've learned all these years is so crystal clear. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. What a statement. That could preach another two weeks right there. Now the God who gives peace, who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by his blood that ratified an eternal covenant. This is the summation of the entire epistle. This is the summation. If I were to say to you, we could spend weeks on this. Well, we spent 42 weeks on this. Really? Because this is a summary of the entire epistle. that ratified an eternal covenant 
may equip you in every good work of His, listen, to do His will, to accomplish through you what is pleasing to Him in the presence of God. And He will do this through Christ Jesus, to whom be glory as the eternal ages roll on. Amen. The whole purpose of everything here is the, the writer wants the readers to understand the purpose of God is to make Make them complete in everything. To, to make them complete in every good work to do the will of God. There's nothing in here about our will. Never. Make you complete. And that's done through Christ. Through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Through the great shepherd, the Lord Jesus. Make you complete in every good work to do his will. Not yours, not mine, not somebody else's. Working in you. That which is well-pleasing in his sight. Well, what's well-pleasing in his sight? We just spent the whole message telling us. Through Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. This benediction is tremendous. It says again, the writer urges the readers to rely on the power of God to do his will through his Son, our Savior. Verse 22, And I beseech you, brethren, suffer the word of exhortation, for I have written a letter unto you in few words. The warning is about being impatient with his words of encouragement. And they're strong. Sometimes encouragement is a strong letter. As strong as this letter was to these Hebrews, the fact was that it was designed to encourage the believer to go on to follow Christ with their all and without hesitation. For the others, it was a warning that if they departed from Christ, death was inevitable. That's clearly seen. The letter was very instructive in nature as well as very powerful in his content. Know ye that our brother Timothy is set at liberty with whom if he comes shortly I will see you. Timothy was in prison when and where is not known. The writer said that he was freed and that he and Timothy would come to visit these Hebrew saints. Salute all them that have the rule over you which you already saw and all the saints they be of Italy. Salute you, grace be with you all. Amen. Lord, thank you again for the tremendous lessons pertaining to Christ, the purpose of the sacrifice, the greatest of all sacrifices of Christ, and to have access to God, access to you, to the throne, is, is a privilege that is absolutely remarkable. And all that it took for us to get that access was through your Son. And even as we partake of the bread and cup, this evening, let us never forget that it was the blood of your Son. It was the, the sacrifice of Christ that brought us into this fellowship with you, into this ability to have access to your very throne, into that which we never deserve. May you be glorified, Lord. May you be ever lifted up. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Wonderful study in the epistle to the Hebrews. And again, Lord willing, next time, in the morning, we're going to go through Romans. And in the evening, we're going to go through Galatians. So, be sure to have your Bibles. Let everybody know what we're doing. If, it, if it's a blessing to you, let others know. Um, don't be selfish with it with your blessings, spiritual blessings. And uh, God willing, we'll see you next time. Have a blessed week. Remember Christ. And that it's all about Him and not about